Hello listeners and welcome to the Cobb's Corner where we do reviews of various movies and TV shows across a variety of genres. I am your host Morgan Cobbs. This is the first official episode of Cobb's Corner. So thank you all for tuning in. This episode is also the first episode of the Marvel Cinematic Universe Infinity Saga review series where we will be reviewing every Marvel movie from 2008 to 2019. For the seasoned veterans, that will be from Iron Man all the way up through Spider-Man Far From Home, or phases 1, 2, and 3. If you've never watched any Marvel movies, don't worry. This podcast will be a way for you to get all caught up on the MCU. If you've seen most or all the MCU content to date, then this podcast will serve as a fun way for you to rewatch the films and fall in love with the MCU all over again and rediscover why we love these movies so much. Whatever the case may be, welcome to the Cops Corner. Stay tuned. We're going to start off the Infinity Saga review series with the very first MCU film that came out way back in the year 2008. That's right, folks. Today, we're going to be talking about Iron Man. Iron Man was the film that started it all and hinted at a shared universe of Marvel superheroes which had never been done before. So they were in uncharted territory, and there was a lot riding on the success of this film, especially since it was Marvel Studios' very first film, and they had pretty much bet the farm on this one movie. Everything was riding on the success of John Favreau's Iron Man. And Iron Man wasn't even an A-list star at the time, and it wasn't a household name. He was more B, C tier. He wasn't well known. Um, wasn't as well known as, say, like, I don't know, Spider Man or the X Men at that time. But through Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark and John Favreau as the director, they were able to successfully pull it off. And uh, the film stars Robert Downey Jr. as billionaire playboy and tech visionary Tony Stark. Stark thought that everything was going great for him and his company, Stark Industries, until he realizes the full extent of the damage that his weapons were doing to innocent people, and this realization caused him to question his legacy, his image, and the future of his company. A spoiler the warnings in full effect for those who have not yet seen this movie. Without any further ado, let's go to Cop's Corner. The movie is set in either the year 2008 or 2009. The exact time frame is unclear. The wartime period is updated to Afghanistan from Iron Man's Vietnam War comic book origin. In the opening scene, we see Tony's military convoy ambushed, and a bomb bearing the name of his company goes off right next to him, causing a lot of shrapnel to enter his chest. He's then captured by the Ten Rings, which is a terrorist network that shows up periodically throughout the MCU. More on that in future episodes. Then the screen cuts to the title of Iron Man. 36 hours earlier in Las Vegas, Tony receives an award for his work in the field of weapons development. And the award is presented by Colonel James Rhodey Rhodes, played in this movie by Terrence Howard who did not reprise his role in any future films. We then see Tony, along with his bodyguard, played by John Favreau, who's also the director of this film, as I mentioned earlier, gambling at a casino as the award ceremony is happening. And in place of Tony, Stark, Obadiah Stane, played by Jeff Bridges, accepts the award on Tony's behalf. The next day, Tony is late for his weapons demonstration in Afghanistan, where he demonstrates a Jericho missile, which will be important, later on in the film. Following the weapons demo, he's given a military escort back to the base, and now now we're all caught up with the story. We know what happens next. Tony ends up in a cave in the Afghan mountains where he is forced not only to build a Jericho missile, the same missile that, from his weapons demonstration earlier, for the Ten Ring cell that captured him, but also he is forced to see how his weapons are being used by these terrorists thereby realizing that the military convoy was killed by the same weapons that he created to defend them in the first place. 
Someone at Stark Industries is dealing under the table. Along with the Dr. Ho Yinsen, played by Iranian actor Sean Taub, uh, Tony is able to disassemble the, Cher- the Jericho missile and create the Mark I Iron Man armor. He then uses the armor to burn all the Stark weapons at the base and escape. Tony escapes the, ca- the cave through Yinsen's sacrifice. His departing words are, don't waste it. Don't waste your life. Upon his return to the United States, Tony calls for a press conference where he announces the end of Stark Industries' production and sale of weapons. This new direction for the company gives him the opportunity to further develop the arc reactor technology used in his first suit and to correct the mistakes of his past. He develops and builds both Mark II and Mark III armors and uses them to liberate the town called Gomira from the Ten Rings, which is the town where Yinsen's family was killed. Upon returning home, Tony's secretary and girlfriend, Virginia Pepper Potts, played by Gwyneth Paltrow, confronts him about his missions and the toll they might be taking on him personally. After a brief confrontation, she agrees to help him and discovers that the plot to kill Tony and the weapons that were given to the Ten Rings terrorists were all orchestrated by none other than the envious Obadiah State, who is a colleague of Tony Stark's father, Howard Stark, Uh, Howard Stark was the founder of Stark Industries and one of the founding members of the Strategic Homeland Intervention Enforcement and Logistics Division, or SHIELD for short, more on them in future episodes, but Obadiah Stane was the one who filled the void after the passing of his longtime colleague, Howard Stark, and then at 21, Tony Stark returned and took over the company from Obadiah Stane, so Obadiah Stane has always kind of been envious of Tony and the fact that he will never be Tony Stark, that he will never live up to either his his form his former colleague Howard Stark or Howard Stark's son Tony. So Obadiah has always been envious of Tony. The third act consists of a final showdown in which Tony Stark's Iron Man faces off against Obadiah Stane's Iron Monger, although his name is not explicitly stated in the film. The two battle through the streets of Malibu and the Stark Industries Research Lab. The battle ends when Pepper overloads the arc reactor at the facility, thereby killing Obadiah and causing an explosion. The press conference the following day is meant to clarify any rumors about a possible Iron Man walking amongst us. Stark is given a cover story and note cards from Agent Coulson of S.H.I.E.L.D. saying that the Iron Man was Tony Stark's bodyguard and that Obadiah was on vacation. They had like sworn statements from like 50 witnesses. Once Tony steps up to the podium, he goes off off script and does not, in more than one way, which I'll explain in a second, goes off script, um, not following the cover story that was given to him by S.H.I.E.L.D., and he just says, I am Iron Man, and the closing credits start with Black Sabbath's Iron Man closing out the very first MCU film. Uh, before I continue, I just want to mention that the line, I am Iron Man, According to director John Favreau, Robert Downey Jr., he ad-libbed that line. That line was not in the script. And according to co-star Jeff Bridges, he claims that Iron Man had no official script to begin with. A lot of those scenes were improvised, and the co-stars just had to keep up with Robert Downey Jr.'s ability to just steal every scene and just nail every screen test. And So really, you see the kind of intellect behind Robert Downey Jr. as an actor with that line, I am Iron Man, so essential to the MCU going forward, and it was not in the original plan. Now, some of the best lines are the ones that are improvised, like in Jaws, when they said, we're going to need a bigger boat, improvised. Midnight Cowboy, hey, I'm walking here, improvised. So, just wanted to point that out. If you thought that this movie was over, then you were greatly mistaken. The film and every other MCU film going forward will have at least one post credit scene. In this film's post credit scene, Tony Stark is approached by Nick Fury, the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Fury informs Stark that he has just become a part of a bigger universe, that he's not the only superhero in the world, and he wants Stark to join his Avengers initiative. The essential themes of this movie are legacy and change. Tony Stark starts out this movie 
as a peace-hating, warmongering arms dealer who's kind of cocky and egotistical. And then he ends the film in as a sort of peace peacekeeping, you know, freedom fighter. And after spending weeks in a cave, you know, he flashes the peace sign after he's after he's rescued, and that comes up in future films. But after being faced with that harsh reality of his life's work and his legacy, and he makes that conscious decision to make things right and to fix that legacy, to fix his image, to do something different. He was given a second chance at life, going through that cave. Coming out of that cave, a new man, a changed man, a hero, determined to do right by those that he put in harm's way. Is that line in the film, that he, that he, the line goes, I want to protect the people that I put in harm's way. So, this film planted two main seeds for the MCU going forward. Uh, in addition to being the kickoff for the over a decade of Marvel movies that we all know and love today. It was the promise of a shared universe of superheroes that we all know and love today. The promise of a shared universe and the establishment of, or the first mention, rather, of S.H.I.E.L.D., or the Strategic Homeland Intervention Enforcement and Logistics Division, which I will refer to henceforth as S.H.I.E.L.D. I will not explicitly state a uh, spell out shield but the two main seeds two main takeaways the two big impacts that this movie has had on the mcu overall is the establishment of shield and the promise of a shared universe of marvel superheroes that there were others like Tony uh, in the coming years you all enjoyed my review of Iron Man. Our next film will be The Incredible Hulk, which will star Edward Norton, um, actor best known for his roles in the movies Fight Club and American History X. He will be starring as gamma radiation scientist Bruce Banner in The Incredible Hulk, which is our next film. Be sure to like and share this podcast wherever you are listening from, and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Leave in the comments any suggestions that you have for other movies or franchises, new and old, that you would like me to review. Also, in the comments section, feel free to kind of say whether you agreed or disagreed with my summary and analysis of Iron Man. You know, love to hear from, from the listeners. Thanks for, thank you for listening, and I will talk to all of you.